listen, we know what it's like to be underwater on a hundred different things. And then uh, you have a pipe burst and you're literally underwater. Hello, and welcome back to another episode of the Pre-Shift Podcast, where we dive deep into what it takes to run great restaurant teams. I'm your host, DJ, and today I'm sitting down with Irene Lee. Irene co-founded Maymay, a food truck turned restaurant turned dumpling company in Boston, and now Prep Shift, a restaurant consultancy that helps small businesses thrive while remaining loyal to their values. My name is Irene Lee, and I am the co-founder of Maymay Dumplings, and I'm also the co-founder of Prep Shift, a consulting, coaching, and workforce training company. Maymay opened in 2012 and has become a perennial favorite in Boston, racking up more local and national awards than I have time to list. But I do want to highlight Irene's recent James Beard Leadership Award win in 2022. But after enjoying a long-running success, the pandemic forced Lee and her sibling business partners, Andrew and Margaret, to rethink whether or not they wanted to be a restaurant at all. Irene and I get to dive into what that meant, how it spurred prep shift, and how she keeps her staff retained. As always, the Pre-Shift podcast is brought to you by Seven Shifts, workforce management for restaurants. Now, in September of 2020, Irene posted an article on the May May website blog titled, This is Not a Restaurant. That blog detailed how May May would adapt in the pandemic, and it morphed into a meditation on what independent restaurants and their owners need to survive. Um, and that's kind of what led me to thinking about Prep Shift. Um, Prep Shift started out as an idea um, that was basically just like, what of all the things we can do, how are we going to support independent restaurants? And so Prep Shift has been through a couple iterations. Um, but right now, what we do is essentially coaching and consulting. And a lot of that is funded by municipalities, um, by the state of Massachusetts, and by other third parties. So we're kind of like, we're not your dad's consulting firm. And we a lot of our clients, you know, are people who would never even think about hiring consultants in a traditional sense. And so we try to bring our lived experience, mine um, and my co-founders, Dylan and Carla's, um, our experience working in restaurants, working for restaurants as service providers, um, and to really bring, like, having been there <laughs> to the table. The way May May evolved was to transition out of being just a restaurant. While you can still go down and sit there to eat their famous dumplings, the restaurant has extended into multiple revenue streams, engaging its staff and customers in different ways. Today, Maymay operates um, a what we call a factory slash cafe slash classroom. And um, we are open for service um, only two days per week. And the other days we manufacture dumplings and we hold dumpling classes. Um, we also take our product to um, tons of farmers markets around the state. And so that's um, where a lot of our revenue is generated. And we came to this conclusion um, in part because of the real estate opportunity we had, um, and also because in thinking about what we were really hearing from our customers about what they wanted, um, it's more about experience um, across the board and less about, I want to come into your restaurant and sit down and eat there. Um, and so, you know, we started selling dumplings partway through the pandemic at farmers markets and they took off, you know, selling like hotcakes. Um, there were so many different experiments during COVID and the one that really crushed it was dumplings. And so we basically said like, okay, can we like, can we own and sell every aspect of the dumpling experience? So I think for us, the cafe classroom is like, okay, you can come and watch us make dumplings, or you can come and we can teach you to make dumplings, or you can come and just order dumplings, <laughs> or you can come and buy dumplings to take home. Um, and so I think we're trying to capitalize on the enthusiasm around the product um, and to, to monetize that in a bunch of different ways. Um, the other thing that I feel like is important to us is bringing a level of kind of transparency um, and uh, and like realism to what we're doing. And so uh, when you come to the factory, um, you can see the production space. Um, you can see the dumplings being made. Um, we also show you how to make dumplings. So like, it's not a secret. There are no secret recipes. There's no like confidential information. Um, I think that really speaks to one of our core values, which is about generosity and sharing. And um, 
on another level, like we also were just like getting old and like don't want to work at night <laughs> <Fair enough. Fair laughs> um, and want to work minimal weekends. Um, and so I think that for me to say May May is not a restaurant anymore um, was very bittersweet, um, but it also just felt like the smart next step in a bunch of ways. Um, and I, I would say we're, we're very happy um, with the niche that we've kind of carved out for ourselves. Leah's also found that these new business models have helped to tell more of the May May story. Diverse revenue streams all kind of tell a different part of the story. And I think you build brand loyalty with the storytelling. And so when we sell someone a dumpling class and they come in and take the class, um, we, we are, you know, essentially marketing to them for 90 straight yeah. minutes. <laughs> um, sure. And that's that's so much more opportunity to build a relationship than, you know, sending a server to their table. Um, and so I think that's one of the other things that we encourage clients to think about is like, how, what are the things that build the relationship? Um, and maybe it's doing like more takeout, but it's probably something that's higher touch or something that is, um, more unusual or harder to find. Um, so I think that's one of the things that it's all in service of is how to tell the story and build those relationships. Now, my biggest question for Lee was about staffing a hybrid business like Maymay. Do you have separate staff for each arm of the company? Lee assured me that all of their team receives cross-training and what exactly goes into it. So we cross-train the majority of our staff. Um, it kind of depends on like their availability. We're, we're fortunate that the farmer's market schedule makes it so that we can have a lot of employees who work once a week. Um, it's great for us. It's great for them. Um, but the majority of our full-time team members have to be cross-trained to do everything. Um, and so for the most part, um, they're kind of centered in one department, but we have the cafe department, the production department, the farmer's market department, and the classes department. So um, there are a lot of opportunities, which again, like I think is nice for our team. Um, they get to learn new things and um, kind of have new challenges as they move into other parts of the business. That's very cool. Do you think that that is something, the cross-training and different opportunities, do you think that has an effect on employee retention at all? Um, or is it, you know, I'm, am I making... Yes. Okay, so yes. Okay. 100%. Okay. I'm not just making it up. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think we give people an opportunity to use different parts of their brain. And I also think that, um, I don't know, essentially we're telling people, like, we think we can teach you to do anything. Um, you don't have to walk in with experience in anything. Um, if you are like attentive and, um, like smart and on top of it, like we'll, we'll bring you anywhere with us. Um, and I think that's kind of like an overall attitude around employment, um, and around like culture building that I see as super effective, um, not just at Maymay, but, um, at any organization where, you know, it's like you weren't hired to be a cog. Um, like we're going to bring you in and like sky's the limit for both of us. That cross training for staff also has another benefit in staff retention. In the study this year, we found that training is one of the top places operators invest their dollars into keeping employees around and cross training likely does is a great way to do it. One of the things that I think is most important is, um, having our team members feel like they're part of something. Um, and, I know that that's like how people lead really successful cults too. Um, but well. <laughs> I think that like, you know, we, we want them to feel like their work means something, even if it is just folding dumplings for an eight hour shift. And one of the ways that we do that um, is through our open book management um, system, which um, we now call team wide, team wide financial engagement. Um, Cause it's a little bit, a little bit more accurate. Um, but basically at Maymay, the way we do um, TFE is we have a quarterly meeting and we look at the major expense categories and the major revenue categories. We get feedback from people about what they're seeing in their day to day work and if they're seeing it reflected in the numbers, um, what ideas they have for improvements um, or changes. And um, we set goals for the next quarter. And I think that. I don't know, like, it's really simple. But like, if you can feel like, you know, if you're winning or losing, <laughs> um, that's like a good feeling. 
And I, even during COVID, you know, we, we showed people like, here's what we thought we were going to bring in in revenue. And here's what we actually did. Um, sort of people having a sense of what's going on in the business. Um, and like, if we're midi- meeting our goals or not, I feel like that's just like that, that dignifies their contribution in a way that in many kind of like low wage jobs, I think, I think doesn't happen. Um, and so can they take pride in our wins as a business? Um, and can they also help us in the moments when we're failing as a business? Um, so asking them to really be part of what we're doing, I think, is something that the folks who we bring in um, really respond well to. Another retention tactic is open book finance, which we've covered recently on the show. But Lee has an interesting approach on how to make it work for your team. Yeah, and that's actually part of why we're trying to like kind of rebrand um, to, to what we're calling team-wide financial engagement, because... Open book management kind of makes it sound like you're showing everyone everything all at once, uh, and and you're really not. You shouldn't. And so we teach um, team wide financial engagement as three three like pillars or like three legs of a stool. So the first thing you have to do is educate people so that they do know what they're going to be looking at. Um, then you give them the access to the information. They actually look at it. And then you create an opportunity and an incentive for them to engage with the material and to try to make changes and meet goals. And those three things all have to happen or it is not going to be successful. Um, We've had clients who are like, wow, open book sounds so great. I'm going to show the staff the P&L tomorrow. And we're like, no, don't do that (laughs) (laughs) because it can be really, yeah, disastrous to give people information without context. Um, And so that's how we roll it out with our clients. We start by making sure everyone understands how to read a P&L, what are the benchmarks, and um, what are kind of like the core tenets of running a super functional business that knows how to set goals and meet them. Then we actually show them numbers. Um, and typically, um, we advocate for showing the five line PL. So, revenue and profit, top and bottom, and then three major expense categories COGS, direct labor, and overheads. And then, I don't know, like if you're in a business where, um, like Meme, for example, where a lot of our dumplings are sold as retail you might break revenue down into its component parts or like, wow, like we want to see how classes did in the summer versus the winter. Um, So often revenue breakdown is another layer that we might go to, but for the most part, we're looking at the five line P and L. And we, again, advocate that folks not go too much deeper than that. Um, And part three is basically creating these, um, these team challenges or like in, you know, in Ann Arbor, Jihei, I think, calls them like mini games or initiatives. Um, but basically, like if we zoom in on a section of the PL, can we create a measurable goal around this and engage everybody in it? And so that's the third leg of the stool. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, I-, I love Jihei and I love what Zingerman's does. And I think that their their brand of open book management requires you to like really have your shit together yeah (laughs) Um, and so like i think on some level for us at prep shift tfe is like um for like the c plus students uh and not the a plus students like (laughs) can we can we kind of get something underway that helps facilitate more alignment even if the pnl is like still a little bit messy um, and so I think that's like what we're really excited about. Um, so much respect for, for what they do. Um, and also see a need to, to, to bring it even more, um, to like a simplified level. Now, I just want to take a quick break to share an exciting update from seven shifts. Usually I don't do this, but our users have been waiting for it for a long time. I know I don't have to tell you that running payroll is a lengthy manual process, data entry, checking multiple systems, cross-referencing, triple checking. So I'm excited to announce that 7 Shifts Payroll is now available in the U.S. Now you can schedule your employees, manage the time clock, calculate tips, and pay your team in one app. And when you make the switch to 7 Shifts Payroll, your first three months are on us. To learn more, head to 7 slash make the switch. Now back to the show. As Leah's mentioned, what they've learned at May May has inspired much of her work at PrepShift. 
at the core, Lee is dedicated to helping restaurants afford their values. She's helping them figure out how to afford to pay people more, eliminate tipping, and build an equitable restaurant for their ownership as well as the staff. But Lee recognizes that in order to do so, you have to either make more or spend less. Ideally, it's a little bit of both, and it also takes a pretty long time. The two options they have for improving the business are essentially bring in more revenue or reduce your expenses. Um, and depending on um, which kind of um, pathway makes more sense, um, depending on the particulars of their P&L, um, we help them create strategies um, to generate more profit and to generate more operating capital. And yeah, I think there are so many things that restaurant owners would love to do um, that we can't afford. Um, like we would love to use all compostable, uh, renewable, everything all the time. <laughs> and that's hard. Um, we would love to pay a living wage. Um, that's hard too. And we also would love to offer a really great value to our customers, um, a value that, uh, you know, really knocks it out of the park. And we can't do that either. Um, many of us, I think, if we could give the food away for free, we would. Um, because we love feeding people. Um, we didn't get into this um, for, for, for the love of running a business. Um, but I think for me, one of the things that I realized in my journey as an entrepreneur, and one of the things that I see a lot of our clients coming to, is that if your goals outpace your profitability, um, that's a really dangerous place to be in. So it might be that like you can't pay a living wage until you are X percent profitable. Um, that's just the reality for a lot of businesses. And so one of the things I think we try to help clients with is to like figure out what goals are appropriate for where they are in building the business. And then to help them see like, what is the pathway to, for example, paying a living wage? Um, you can't just start doing it tomorrow. That is going to put you out of business. Um, so how do you set like a reasonable goal and, and keep yourself on track towards it? And then on the flip side, there are also operators who say things like, oh, we could never pay a living wage. And we, we don't love that mentality either. Um, so we want to tell them like there is a way to get there. There is a pathway. Um, and whether it's that you don't think you'll ever get there or you're mad that you're not there already, um, like we, we want to kind of close that gap. Now, we wouldn't be having these tough conversations if we're easy just to make more money. There are many ways to go about it, but Lee contends that raising menu prices is inevitable. Many operators are reluctant to do it and drive customers away, but a slower, more tactful approach can get you where you need to be. I do think that menu prices are ultimately going to be the driver of um, profitability for restaurants. Um, but I think there are tons of different levers to be pulled, and menu prices are just one of them. Um, so, for example, like I think in a lot of independent restaurants, you know, you could probably shave a percentage point off cost of goods if you were to monitor food waste, um, negotiate with your vendors, uh, like reformulate some recipes. Um, there's opportunity in so many different places. And, um, you know, raising prices is, is one opportunity. The other thing that like, I think, I often see is operators are so scared of raising prices because they just know that one guest who's going to complain and that vocal minority is going to haunt them. Um, and I've been there. And I think what I've seen is that there are a ton of ways to like mitigate that kind of negative reaction. Um, the first thing is like, you want to raise prices very intentionally and you probably want to do it gradually. Um, you also can communicate about why you're raising the prices um, and, you know, hope that people remember that like grocery stores don't lock in their prices for you. And so like neither should restaurants. Um, but I think a lot of it is in the messaging and the relationship. And um, yeah, like if you're just going to raise everything by four dollars, like, yeah, people aren't going to be happy about that. But I do think that in the US, like we do undervalue restaurant dining, and that's going to have to change um, for for the industry to continue to survive. So I think all these things have to happen. And it's the matter of like pulling the levers that are available um, to a given restaurant. Um, and, uh, you know, there's no 
single solution. Um, it's like, you can't just hit a home run. Like you have to grind it out um, with the, uh, I don't know, singles or whatever. Baseball. That's, that's, um, yeah. But like, it's, <laughs> right. it, it's a, it's a grind. Um, and so there's just not, there's not one kind of magic solution, unfortunately. Another aspect of the puzzle is the all important question on tipping. All of this around wages is pretty complicated. And um, as you know, like tipping has a pretty ugly history um, with like its roots in slavery and the reconstruction era. And um, I would love for us to be in a world with no tipping. Um, It's going to take a lot to get us there. And I know that that can't happen overnight. Um, In Massachusetts, um, there are particularly restrictive laws around tip pooling. Um, And so pooling with the back of the house, even if everyone is paid a full minimum wage, is still not permitted in Massachusetts. Um, There is going to be, I think, a ballot initiative coming up about instating one fair wage in Massachusetts. And I think the more we see um, data coming out of, uh, you know, Oregon, Washington, California, the states that have implemented one fair wage, the less scary it's going to be to take that leap. Now, Irene understands that it can be scary to raise your prices and the concern of alienating customers is real. But she also calls out that restaurants are in a tough spot because of the laws regarding tip service charges and how they vary from state to state. I get that it's scary. I get that, um, operators don't want to upset their customers. Um, And so we're seeing a lot of proliferation of service fees, admin charges, back of house fees. um, And lately, that's really pissing off customers. And so it's like, these are um, like machinations that we're taking on because the laws don't fit our needs. Um, So the systemic change, which, you know, would be ideal would be to change the way the laws are written. Um, and everything that restaurants are doing that's pissing people off is just a response to the laws not making sense. Um, so that's something I think um, we need a lot of consumer engagement and education on. Um, and so it'll be interesting to see what happens in Massachusetts um, as the, the ballot initiative um, kind of moves forward um, towards next November. Lastly, one of the more important things that Lee is doing at Prep Shift is helping restaurants understand data and what it says about their priorities. I think it comes down to two very different things. Um, One is um, the storytelling. Um, How do we tell ourselves the story of our business? How do we tell our team? And then how do we tell our guests on the outside? And then the other thing is the financials. Um, I guess the finances tell a story in a way. Um, So maybe it's the same thing. But the financials tell the story. If the operator cares to read it, there is a lot to be found. And so for us, it really does go back to finances, back to basics. I hate saying that because like, I don't like financials. I'm not a numbers person. But as I said, like, I learned, yeah, I I learned that you can only do cool shit if you can afford it. Um, And so that's why the numbers matter. Um, So I would say, you know, if I had to kind of center it around something, it would be knowing the story and making changes accordingly. And Lee is excited to continue with PrepShift and help more operators live their values and celebrate their success. Thank you for checking out this episode of the PreShift podcast. If you enjoyed this one, leave a review and share it with one friend to help the show grow. We couldn't do it without your support. As always, I'd love to hear what you think. You can email me at dj at sevenshifts.com. You can also find more great insights like these on the Seven Shifts blog and across all of our social channels. Catch you next time.